Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and before we get started on tonight's story, I want to tell you a quick thing about tonight's author. All of you know Jack Townsend, or you know Tales from the Gas Station at least, which is written by Jack Townsend. All Jack Townsend's books are available now on Amazon, and almost all of them are available in audiobook form, uh, narrated by yours truly, except for the fourth one that's currently being worked on as we speak. I'm also going to let you know about one thing you may not have known that's from Jack Townsend, and that's the Snake's Paw Podcast. The Snake's Paw Podcast features Jack as one of the voices, as well as every episode is written by Jack Townsend. It's a lot of fun. It's a hilarious romp between sci-fi, horror, and comedy in between, and very much worth your time if you enjoy hearing his stories here or on Amazon. Take a look at the links in the description down below to find his books as well as The Snake's Paw. And now, on to tonight's story. April 1st, 1.45 a.m. Holy crap, this is nuts. Okay, try and stay with me here. I've only got like 15 minutes before the next spirit shows up, and I really want to get this all down before it's too late. So, just like Jerry, uh, I mean, okay, the spirit, or God, or whatever it was, said, at one in the morning, I got a special visitor at the gas station. Now, this one didn't appear in a cloud of fog. There was no crack of lightning or flickering lights. On the hour, I heard the same noise, the mysterious chime. Just once this time, one in the morning. It came in the form of an aura, a blindingly white light. If it was outside, you could probably notice it from orbit, but it was contained here in the gas station and it was coming entirely from the bathroom. I could only see the radiance of it poking out from the space between the door, but I could feel the brightness, like it was burning a piece of my soul. I'm sure if I looked directly at it, my eyes would have burned out of my sockets. I was only there for a few seconds, then I heard the toilet flush and the light was no more. When the door to the bathroom opened, I was not prepared for who I was about to see. The man, the spirit who emerged, looked young. He was clean shaven with red hair on top. He wore a tan overcoat on top of a black half turtleneck. When he saw me, he smirked. Rick Astley? I asked, barely able to contain my surprise. No, he said. I'm the spirit of April Fool's past. Long past? No, your past. Assuming you are, he pulled the notepad out of his coat pocket and flipped it open to one of the pages. Jack. That, that's what the name tag says. Uh, may I be so bold as to inquire what business brings you here? Your welfare, Jack. I was afraid you were going to say that. The ginger spirit crossed the room, doing an unnecessary dance as he moved. He clapped his hands, shimmied, and then he was standing on the other side of the counter. He reached out to me and said, Rise, mortal. Walk with me. I'm, I'm actually good here. He put his hands on the counter and leaned in close, close enough that I could clearly hear him as he whispered. I am a spirit. I come from a realm beyond your comprehension. Do you really think I came all the way here to give you the option to say you're good here? He had a point. Okay, then, I said standing. How does this work? Take my hand. We're going on a little adventure to another time and place. We're going somewhere you've seen before, and we're going to find the moment you lost faith, the moment you abandoned the magic of the holiday season. I took his hand, and a spring-loaded buzzer hidden in the palm of his hand let out a mechanical whir as it simulated a low-voltage electric shock. Gotcha! He laughed. Not surprisingly, he was the only one laughing. I waited patiently for him to remove the gimmicky toy, and let him take my hand again. All right, now on to business. I want you to think back. Remember the moment you want to forget the most. Remember the worst April Fool's Day of your life. Well, this ought to be fun, I thought aloud. Right then, the gas station disappeared. The spirit and I were suspended in nothingness. The world, the universe, and even our bodies had ceased to be. And just as suddenly, it all came crashing back. Only now, we were someplace else. The walls were wood panels covered in posters and work orders tacked to wherever space is allowed. The man in the corner sat behind a cheap plastic desk that looked like it had been picked up from the side of the road. He was a big guy sweating through his button-up shirt despite the box fan blowing air at his face from a couple feet away. It was much more humid in this place. The smell of cigarette smoke wasn't enough to cover the pungent odor of dead fish that filled the air. Flies buzzed past us as I looked at the spirit. He looked at me and smiled. What is this place? I asked. Do not worry, 
the spirit said. Nobody here can see you. You're but shadows. Shadows of what's been. Yeah, I get that, but I have no idea where we are. Does this not look familiar to you? The spirit said. His inflection made it seem like this was a rhetorical question, but the look in his eyes told me he was desperately hoping I would make the connection soon. Sorry, I said. I'm lost. The Rick Astley spirit retrieved his notepad, thumbed through the pages, and stared at something written there. He poked out his bottom lip and furrowed his brow. Is something wrong? I asked. His face shot up. What? Oh, uh, no, no, nothing's wrong. It's just... Are you sure you don't know this place? Why would I? So you're positive this isn't your foster home from when you were in the sixth grade? I laughed. Look around. Does this look like a foster home? I think this is some kind of business. I walked up to the wall and inspected the work orders that adorned it. Tiny yellow sheets of paper with information typed onto it in cryptic shorthand. Nothing any average person would understand except for the stamps on each that said either closed or open. Bus house, three job, two out, closed. VIP den, five job, five out, closed. Underground, VB, five job, all dead, open? I'm sorry, the spirit said. This is actually quite embarrassing, and all the years I've been doing this, I've never taken someone to the wrong past before. Here, uh, let's return and start over. The phone on the desk rang. We watched as the heavyset man answered it in a gruff voice. He said, yeah, what the hell does he want? Okay, send him in. The spirit reached for me, but I pulled back. Wait. I said. I want to see where this is going. It's not a television show, Jack. This is someone's worst memory. It, it, it's way better than TV. Right then, the door opened. I instantly recognized the young man who entered. He wasn't in the sixth grade, but there was absolutely no denying that this was a younger me. What the fuck? I said. The look on the spirit's face, or... I guess Rick Astley's face, told me that he was genuinely confused by this turn of events. The younger me appeared to be in his late teens, perhaps early twenties. He had short hair, camo pants, and a black long sleeve shirt. He must have been sweating his ass off in the weather, but he kept a professional look on his face and approached the man in the corner. Mr. Leachman, my name is... I know who you are! The heavy man leaned back in his chair and managed to look down his nose at the younger me while looking up at him. You're Tommy's kid, brother. Yes, sir. Look, it's a damn shame what happened to him. They ever find the guy who hit his car? No, sir. Damn shame, I tell you. You know what? They ought to make it to where a hit and run is an instant death penalty. But you know those pussies in the government would never do something like that. No, that would make too much sense. I suppose so. The spirit and I closed in on these shadows from the past. Listen, the heavy guy continued. I could see new sweat forming on his face. I sent Tommy's last paycheck to his address. That's not why I'm here. But what is it then? Before the accident, Tommy... He told me he might be able to get me a job, and... Well... With the funeral and everything, money's getting tight. I was wondering, I mean... I know I can't take on his role right away, but I'm a quick learner... I'm not afraid to work hard, get dirty, and the heavy man scooted his seat back, sc scraping it loudly against the floor. Hold on, he said. What exactly did Tommy tell you about this job? I know all about exterminating. Tommy showed me how to use the different poisons. Uh, I helped him fumigate our aunt's condo when she got fleas. I know how to- Listen, kid. The heavy man stood up. I ain't gonna bullshit you. This job requires a certain skill set, and you ain't got it. No, no, wait a second. Tommy said Tommy's dead, kid. It don't matter what he said. The younger me screamed. It mattered to me! Silence filled the room. A long, unnatural silence. The two men stood in place, unmoving, unblinking, unspeaking. It felt like the most intense stare-down in history, but then I noticed the black fly, swollen and fat, stuck in place in mid-air right in front of my face. It wasn't just the scream that brought the moment to a screeching halt. Nope. Time itself had literally stopped. Enough! The spirit screamed the word like it was poison he wanted out of his mouth. Cut the crap, Jack. How are you doing this? What is this place? I poked the suspended fly, but it remained frozen. 
Something told me that a Mack truck wouldn't have been able to pull it out of place. The force of time, of what was already written, was not something mortals could ever hope to overcome. I said the only thing that I could think of. I have no idea what's going on here, but I can tell you one thing. This never happened. Do you think I'm playing around here? Asked the spirit, dressed like the 80s musician turned meme, Rick Astley. I'll have you know, I take this job very seriously. I'm sure you do. He ran his hand through his voluminous red hair and took a deep breath. Then he circled the room twice, stopped, and smiled. I get it. This isn't your past at all. Well, yeah, Obs. No, in a sense it is. But this isn't your, your past. I don't follow? There is a terminus point in the finite curve of the gas station. He must have accidentally fallen through a gap. There is a remainder in a galactic equation that should have been rounded off. I've heard of this happening before, but the look on my face must have told him he needed to dumb it down just a bit further. Okay, this isn't the correct universe. We're in a version of your past that could have happened, but never did occur. You see, it might sound complicated to you, but no, I get it. Multiverses are all the rage in movies and television right now. I've already had it explained to me a thousand times. Yes, but have you ever had it explained in terms of updog? What's up, dog? Not much. What's up with you? The spirit laughed joyously, then snapped his fingers, bringing the whole scene back to life. The fly buzzed past my face. I watched as it landed in a web in the corner of the ceiling, where it promptly tangled itself up before being set upon by a shiny black spider. So we should probably go back home, right? I mean, considering this isn't even a real memory. The spirit held up a finger and said, hold on, hold on. I want to see where this is going. The door opened without a knock, and a tough-looking guy took a step into the room. As the younger me turned to face him, I registered the monumental realization on his face. He knew he messed up. He pushed too hard, and now he was about to get bounced. The guy looked like he was no stranger to busting heads. Scars on his hands and face, ears misshapen like he had a history of amateur boxing, hands on his sides and clenched in the fists, and a deep-set scowl that looked like it was the only face he was capable of making. It's okay, Bruno, the heavyset man said calmly. Our guest here was just about to leave. We got a problem, boss. Bruno's voice sounded like a bag of rocks. What does a bag of rocks sound like, you might ask? Well, Bruno's voice, of course, but I don't know how else to put it. You had to be there, okay? It was unsettling. Bruno took a step to the side. The younger man understood without being told. It was time for him, or me, to leave. He did so without another word. I went ahead and started to follow, but the spirit caught my arm. Hold up, he said. What are you doing? I asked. I sat through enough boring childhood memories that I know when something juicy is about to happen, and that's most certainly not going to be with the young man walking away. He's a B-story at best, but look at these two. They're like cartoons. So well realized. What's their deal? Who's Bruno? What do they do here? The younger me was already out the door. Bruno closed it behind him. Shouldn't we follow, you know, me? Don't be so selfish, the spirit said. After all these countless eons, I deserve to go off the rails just a little, don't I? As a treat. I didn't have time to answer before the heavy man began speaking. What's the problem? Bruno answered. He's here. Already? Plane must have landed early. He wants to start the job now. Shit. How many does he need? He's calling this a seven job. Guzman in Florida are on call. They can get here in ten minutes. What does that bring us to? Five. Six if I go too. He's not going to be happy if we can't provide him with the team he paid for. You think I don't know that? Shit. I got some mercs on their way out of East City, but they won't be here before day's end. You know, he isn't a patient man. What about him? Bruno pointed at the door with his thumb. Tommy's kid brother, I mean. With me and Guzman on the team, all we need are warm bodies to pad the numbers. Why not give the kid a shot? He doesn't know what we do here. Really? You mean Tommy never? You mean he thinks Tommy died in a car accident? Drops of sweat were dripping from the boss's face onto his desk. He closed his eyes and made a pained expression, like someone was crushing him from the inside. All right. With that word, he fell into his chair. Get the kid back in here. I'll call Guzman in Florida. What do you want me to tell him? 
Tell him only what he needs to know. The two of them froze in place. Once again, time had stopped. The spirit let out a laugh that morphed into the words, Ooh, this is exciting, isn't it? What do you think's happening? What are mercs? Do you think he meant mercenaries? I genuinely don't know where this is going. Uncertainty is such a beautiful thing, isn't it? Well, I'm glad that you're enjoying yourself, but I, I don't share your sense of curiosity or adventure, and I genuinely don't see why I have to be here for any of this. I mean, how about you stay, keep doing this, I'll go back to the gas station. That's not how this works, Jack. Your mind is powering this entire expedition. Come on, let's see what happens next. I didn't mean to grunt as audibly as I did, but the spirit didn't take offense. He just smiled, retrieved his notepad, and continued. I'll make a deal with you. The other option is we untangle this time knot and go visit your foster home that year your brother stole your pants and locked you outside for the day. Remember? The police got called. Why would you? I'll just write up a report saying we went to the correct memory. These visits to the past are mostly just a formality anyway. The only spirit journey that ever matters is the spirit of April Fool's yet to come. I'm only here to familiarize you with the concept. So, what do you say? Get to go off page for a little longer? I threw up my hands. I mean, you're the supernatural entity here, so I'm just the schmuck who's along for the ride. That's the spirit, he said with a punch-inviting grin. Pun intended. He raised his hand, and with a snap of his fingers, we are gone from that place. The air was suddenly hotter, the lights dimmer. I shook my head until my bearings returned, slowly, lazily, and then I saw them. Bruno stood near a set of lockers. The younger me sat on a bench next to him. It was a small room, stuffy like we were underground. I know there's a lot to process, Bruno said. The younger me didn't seem phased. No, I always knew Tommy was into something. He had too much money for an exterminator. I just thought, you know, maybe it was drugs. Bruno opened a locker and began pulling out gear, tactical boots, Kevlar vest, ammo pouch. These were his, he said. They should fit close enough for one job. Impress the big guy, we'll bring you back for the next one. Who is he? Listen, kid. You gotta get those questions out of your system before you see him. This guy is the real deal, but if he catches a whiff that you're an amateur, he might call the job on the spot. What you do here tonight is simple. Keep quiet, follow my lead. I tell you to jump, jump. I tell you to shoot, shoot. I tell you to run. He pulled an automatic rifle from the locker next. The younger me took it without hesitation. Anything else I should know? Someone might try to test you. If anybody tells you that you remind them of someone they knew in the army... That's code to make sure you're on the same team. They tell you that, you respond, I need a drink. You got that? The younger me nodded. Ready? The voice almost made me jump. I forgot the spirit was still here with me. Ready for what? I asked. Well, this part feels like filler. Let's get to the action already, okay? He pointed at the door behind me. It's your show. He reached for the handle, and despite his early proclamation that these were merely shadows of things that once were... He succeeded in interacting with it. It turned. The door swung open. He stepped through. And I followed. Now on the other side, we were transported to a different time and place. Neither very far from the previous time or place. We were outside now. Mosquitoes buzzed in the humid air as the sun set behind a cloudy horizon. There were six men lined up standing at attention near a black SUV. Bruno took one end. The younger me on the other. They were all armed to the teeth. The four in the middle stood tall, battle-worn, confident. Everything about them exaggerated the contrast from me, the runt on the end pretending he knew what he was in for. They weren't alone, though. There was another man with them. The big guy himself. He had dark skin and a thick black beard. A mountain of a man, full of muscle, exuding an air of sheer power. If it came down to a fair fight between him and the six men at attention, well, I sure wouldn't bet against him. When he spoke, the hairs on my neck bristled. All right, ladies. I see some new faces here, so I'm going to keep this quick. My name's Benjamin, and I'm not going to carry any of you. Tonight, we have a single target. Weaknesses are standard, which means bullets will do the trick. Stay off the comms unless there's a surprise. But there won't be any surprises. Any questions? Bruno was the only one who dared speak. What's the target look like? Unclear, but we ought to know it when we see it. 
At last report, it took the appearance of a human, a park ranger named Preston Creekbaum. A 6'2", brown hair, medium build. But that was over 12 hours ago, so the target will not look like that anymore. Any more questions? There were none. At least, none spoken. Good. Load up. The screen froze in time. What the fuck is happening? The spirit asked. There was far less excitement in his voice this time around. This thread, it continues for a while. How is that possible? A pocket reality like this should have fallen apart after a few minutes, but the story goes on and on. I can see a long road out in front of us, but it shouldn't be possible. For an interdimensional cosmic spirit, he sure sounded rattled by the unknown. Kind of ironic, really, when you think about it. So, what now? I asked. The spirit checked its watch. We're actually running out of time. How, how, how could we possibly be running out of time? I only got an hour with you. I need to finish this up before the spirit of April Fool's present gets his turn. And that guy gets pissed when he has to wait. That only raises further questions. Do you mind if we step on the gas a little bit in the story? I shrugged. He smiled. Good. Fast forward mode activated then. Do me a favor. Keep your eyes open for a hammer for. What's a hammer for? I asked. Driving nails. He laughed obnoxiously. With a snap of his fingers, we were transported to a clearing in the middle of a tangled forest. The mercs were gathered in a circle around a bloated corpse in a ranger's uniform. Hey, that's the guy, right? One of the men said. Stop! Screamed Benjamin as he ran towards the group. Get away from it before... One of the eyes on the corpse exploded to the sound of a wet pop, and a long, pink, serpentine creature about the size of a garden snake leapt out of the body. It latched onto Bruno's face. He screamed and tried to grab the creature, but it was too fast. Bruno fell to his knees as the pink snake burrowed through his skull. Benjamin shoved one of the mercs out of the way, screaming, Stay back! Then unloaded a magazine of high-caliber rifle bullets into Bruno's dead body, tearing it to shreds. When the gun was empty and the shooting had stopped, the men looked at one another. One of them ignored the big guy's previous command and stepped over to the wet, meaty puddle of bones and viscera that had once been Bruno and said, Holy shit. What was this? The snake erupted from the gore with the sound of a loud screech. It hit the man, who stood too close, square in the neck, then disappeared under his skin. His face went ghost white, his blood spurted from a hole, but he didn't fall down. His eyes glazed over and he turned to face the others in short, stiff steps. Benjamin screamed as he loaded a new magazine into his gun. Shoot it! It's controlling him! It's... The man with a snake in his neck lifted his rifle and pointed it at the other men. Shadows of the past or not, I instinctively hit the ground before the next round of bullets began to fly. The sudden silence wasn't the most unnerving thing that had happened, but it was up there. When I opened my eyes, I could see bullets trapped in place in midair. Holy flippin' shit, said the spirit. This is not what I expected. He checked his watch again. We're almost done here, but I gotta see where this ends. He snapped his fingers. And we were gone. The muddy earth below me turned hard and cold. The air turned stale. It took me a second longer to realize that we were indoors. I rolled over and got to my feet. This is a small cabin, hardly more than a shed. Benjamin sat near the fireplace, a roaring blaze keeping the cramped room much too hot. He held a blade over the flames, the tip glowing red hot. There was only one other person from the time zone in the room, the younger me. He was covered in blood, but he was breathing. It didn't take a detective to figure out the rest of the crew wasn't as lucky. His shoulder wept a steady stream of blood onto the cabin floor until Benjamin pressed the heated blade into place, cauterizing the wound to the sound of a blood-curdling scream. Good work today, kid, Benjamin said, handing over a flask. The younger me took and drank freely. Sorry about your crew. Eventually, the younger me managed to get out the words, It's okay. The big guy pulled two cigars from his jacket, leaned over and lit them in the fire. He put the first between his teeth, then handed the other to the wounded kid on the floor. The younger me didn't hesitate to take the celebratory smoke. The thing is, Benjamin said, pausing to take a puff, this didn't turn out the way any of us expected. Men died who didn't need to. It wasn't anyone's fault, really. It was the creature's fault. The younger me dropped his cigar and flask, then began to violently cough. His face turned bright red as the coughing became shallower and shallower. He struggled to breathe, fighting the constriction in his neck, but it was no use. He struggled in silence, desperate for air for one more breath, but none would come. Yeah, it was a creature's fault. But I told your boss. I told him what I needed. 
I needed a six-man crew. I needed six pros. But he only gave me five. I saw Bruno watching you. His head wasn't in the game because he was babysitting when he should have been paying attention. Now, I ain't saying that's the reason they're all dead. I just want you to understand that's why I can't let you walk out of this one. His words didn't matter. The younger man on the floor couldn't hear him anymore. Benjamin picked up the flask and made sure the top was on, then stuffed it into his pocket. Sorry, kid. But it is what it is. Wait wait a second, the spirit said loudly. So, you died? What the hell? Benjamin pulled a cellular phone from his pocket. I took a step closer, close enough to see the number he dialed, but it was just a saved contact number, HQ. Benjamin, he said into the receiver. Password Echo Alpha. He froze with his mouth still open, tongue in his teeth, staring straight ahead. Well, this has been interesting, to say the least. I was getting so tired of this spirit. At least I didn't have to deal with him very, very much longer. But it's time for us to get back to your shitty real life. It's boring gas station attendant, shall we? He snapped his fingers. But this time, nothing happened. The world didn't vanish. We stayed put. Exactly like I wanted. What's wrong? I asked in my most innocent voice. Nothing, he lied. Sometimes it takes a couple snaps for it to work, he lied again. He snapped, and the world stayed as it was. It could snap again and again, but as long as I had my wave disruptor on, nothing would change. I removed the device from my pocket. The spirit looked at it and laughed. <laughs> nice camera phone, he said, but I'm afraid you can't take any pictures here. These memories are only in your mind. They don't show up on film and can't be recorded. I adjusted the settings on the disruptor to only cancel out the S-wave frequencies, to the spirit, it probably looked like I was texting. He continued to smile at me nervously until I executed the new routine, causing the memory to resume from right where we left off. Tango 9792 Victor. The spirit jumped as Benjamin resumed talking. The big guy stood and started for the door. Status report. Target's been neutralized. Local team was compromised. Witnesses terminated. Request immediate evac. He stepped into the cold night air and slammed the door shut behind him so hard, dust fell from the ceiling. This is unnatural, but not unheard of, the spirit assured me. I have everything under control. No, I said. I don't think you do. Right then, I woke up gasping for air. Uh, not me that was standing, talking to the spirit. The me on the ground. I gagged and fought and strained against the poison constricting my muscles. I fought hard against whatever the hell that asshole Benjamin had put in that flask. A morsel of air broke through the floodgates, and that was when I knew I wasn't about to die. I tried to scream, but it wasn't time for that yet. My heart pounded and my lungs begged. Every part of me wanted nothing more than to stay alive. It was nothing but luck and sheer force of will that saved me that day, as I struggled against death long enough to take another breath. And then another. The spirit said aloud, Holy fuck, you survived! Of course I survived, I said. How else would I have been alive for us to meet? The spirit shook his head like he thought I wasn't getting it. But this didn't happen. This is an alternate timeline. One where you never worked at the gas station, but instead became a monster hunter or, or something. It's not like... This time when the words froze mid-sentence, it wasn't from any kind of magic or parascience. It was because I rolled up my sleeve to show the spirit how wrong he was. The gears turned quickly once he saw the old scar on my shoulder. The burn from when Benjamin cauterized my wound all those years ago. The spirit couldn't have known exactly what was happening, but he was smart enough to try and run. He went for the cabin door. I stayed close behind him. We passed through together and into another scene from my memory. It was only four years later, but I had gone from a younger man to a world-weary soldier. I was sitting in the recruitment office of the initiative. The commander stood behind the egghead scientists. They listened to my entire story without judgment, the reason for my medical discharge. And they told me something I never heard before. They believed me. And they wanted to help me. The spirit hooked the right and went to the closest door. If this was really the Institute, it would have led to a balcony overseeing the compound's hundred-acre grounds, but it wasn't. Instead, it took us to another memory. A classroom. Only two people in this memory. My commander pointed at the picture on the projection that took up the entire wall. It was a photo of a young man sitting behind a cash register. Jack Townsend, my commander said. 
You'll find his dossier to be an interesting read. You need to study him, imitate, do what he does, live how he lives, think how he thinks. The spirits must believe that you are him. The spirit spun on his heels. There were no other exits in this room. I had him cornered. It was time to go on the offensive. Finally, I wrapped my fingers into the silver-plated knuckles and delivered a clean haymaker across the temple. If the spirit had been human, you would have put him in a coma at the least. Thank God the nerds were right. Silver was enough to put him down. He moaned up at me from the floor, telling me that he wouldn't be a problem anymore. Good, I thought to myself. I have a lot more work left to do tonight. I reset the disruptor and the program settings. Next stop, April Fool's Day. One year ago, I grabbed the spirit by his leg and dragged him back through the doorway. We were transported to the Special Species Containment Unit in the sub-basement of the Liskov Institute. There were two other people in this negatively charged Faraday cage built by non-magnetic titanium and silver. They couldn't see us, but they knew we were here. My commander looked at me from one year ago, then nodded. The old me programmed the disruptor with our exact coordinates. I'd been studying the tech for the greater part of the last decade, and was immediately familiarized with all the settings. Now, my commander said, explain this to me again. In one year's time, the old me elaborated, I'll return to this point in the timeline and drop off the anomaly. It will remain trapped inside these walls for exactly one year. After the temporal energy is worn off, we'll open the cage. He's powerless to escape. The spirit sat up. What? No, you, you can't leave me here for an entire year. I'll go mad with boredom. Sorry, I lied. Wait, he shouted, tears in his eyes. At, at least let me have a, a henway before you go. What's a henway? I asked. He laughed maniacally and answered, about three pounds. I pressed the button on my device and transferred me back to the original timeline. Anyway, sorry. I know that was a slog to read, but part of my job infiltrating this place was acting just like Jack. And for some reason, Jack writes down every single thing that happens to him in this stupid laptop. I had to keep up appearances, didn't I? Oh, I just heard that weird chime again. Twice this time. Two already. I guess that means I gotta go. Like I said, this is nuts. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I want to tell you thanks so much for watching tonight's video or listening to tonight's episode of the podcast. Quick reminder, I am also a narrator over at Chilling. If you guys like the stories that you're listening to here, then I'm sure you'll like the stories that you can listen to over at Chilling, because they're almost the same thing, I'm still narrating them, but you can select your own background music or background sounds, and you could select a whole mess of other narrators, such as Autumn Ivy, Swamp Dweller, and a bunch of my other friends. If you guys are interested in checking out Chilling App, starting up with a free trial, you can use the link in the description down below, or you can head over to thechillingapp.com and also use those free trials to win prizes from their giveaways. And as always, I would love to give a big thank you to everyone who's supporting me over on Patreon. You guys are the real MVPs, you guys keep things going, especially while things have been nuts for me over the past couple of months, and things have been getting crazier and crazier as time goes on. You guys are the ones who are keeping me sane, and I mean that with all sincerity, that you guys have helped me immensely. <laughs> so, in my personal life and my professional life, I want to give a very big thank you to... Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Jacob Fenske, Chance Vernon, Diana Krause, Lakeda Canizales, Mr. B. Foster, Pepper Squeezer, Gavis, Joseph Calarudo, Who to Be, Dante Kincaid, Fox Hound 803, Mephistopheles, Curse Pox Priorch, Bastion Beefcake, Jeff Joyce Cultist, Love You M&M, M, Insanity Gamer X, Jesus Corneo, Yargul, Emma Clark, Jay Kearns, Nimbo Jerry, Sam High, Crusader Chocobo, Adam Marius, Captain Scurvy, Esther Bean, Raiden Morris, Nate Cull, Our Min Sack Time, Angelus, Seclude, That Creepy Chick, Red Shadow Cat, Xavier and Cheyenne, Six Gay Rats in a Trench Coat, Turtle Man, Cryolinian, Lord Life's Best, Goring Tri Magazine, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Michael Inchok, Dirk Diver 030, Matt Bach, Voice of Sand, Shelly J, Michael, The Leader Count, Melted Lake, Polly Sue, William King, Sashi Sasaku, Stricken, Freddy Krueger, Happy Birthday Jason Wilson, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Hades Nephew, Theater Chip, Acid System. Mog, Kiwi the Sloth, Buster's Lampshade, Nico Kyle, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Paulson, and Cory Kenshin. To everyone on this list, everyone in the description, and of course anyone who could support even just one dollar, thank you all so much for making my life significantly easier with this. And if you guys would like to be able to join any of the names that you see here, or down there, or anything at all, head over to patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. And with that, I wish you all a very, very pleasant night, and sweet dreams.